Thank you very much. Uh, I will try to sort of give the big picture. So there will be quite a lot of slides, but we will not be able to go into detail of, of all of them. But I want you to sort of have an idea of what's going on, uh, both in the European Space Agency and also in Copernicus and a little bit nationally, of the newest, juiciest topics. Um, Eric Tanberg, he uh, used to, uh, he, he was sort of uh, the one that was on the TV in Norway commenting the moon landing. And before the moon landing, it was a lot of, of uh, uh, yeah, the television followed uh, the developments and so on. And at some point, you got the first image of the air, air from space. And then he was on television and then he was very, very excited about, oh, it's a lot of opportunities and so on. And, and, and then um, he had also the counterpart from the Met Office there. And then the, the, the other person on TV asked them, the Met uh, person and, uh, uh, about, uh, yeah, what, what, what do you think? What, what, how can you use this in the future and so on? And then the Met person in the middle of the 1960s said, absolutely nothing. <laughs> and I will tell you a little bit how it has changed since then. So <coughs> for ESA, the European Space Agency, you have three different uh, development lines. And yeah, this is working. Uh, so you have metrology, uh, where you have geostationary satellites and you have polar orbit satellites. This is this line. But see here also, this, you have 2010 here and 2030 here, the increase of different types of satellites. So metrology, we have had, and we have, a, we have a, had a programs for, for a long time. We know that, okay, when one type of satellite is dead, it's replaced and so on, and, and it continues and continues. Oh, oops. Uh, and then we have um, the Sentinel program or the Copernicus program. That meant that we had operational Earth observation. And that started in 2014 with Sentinel 1A, and it's just extending and extending with a lot of new missions. And among these are CO2M that we will talk a little bit about today. And we have also a very exciting research line here. So there is so much going on, and I think it's important for the climate community to know all of this, and the potential is extreme for exploitation. Here, here is the ESA's climate change initiative, and the main topic of that has been to sort of uh, do research in order to develop very secure essential climate variables. So the status now is that you have GCOS has defined 55 essential climate variables, 36 benefit from space, and 27 are generated by the ESA climate change initiative. A lot of details here, but we have not time to go into that exactly now. For Norway, in the last period now, we are involved in making these, uh, uh, these uh, essential climate variables. So, so you see, there is a lot on the cold side <laughs> with uh, glaciers, snow. Uh, Met Office is leading sea ice developments, and we are very uh, key also in permafrost. Earlier, we have also been into aerosols, soil moistures, and, and different uh, parameters. But you see here, also, for instance, involved in six high-impact papers in 2021, Nature and Science and so on, and it's a lot of peer-reviewed papers uh, going into this. So this is something that you can also get more info about at a later stage. This is from yesterday. Maybe if you can note this link here. This is where you get all the information about the climate program in ESA. It's going on from 2023 to 29. It has, it, it has the goal of expanding this ECV portfolio. You see some new stuff here. Long-lived greenhouse gases, river discharge, things that we have not done before. Then it's also responding to the Paris Agreement, so which is relevant for what we are talking about today. So maybe we will have some projects there also, Glenn. Uh, then we have also linking Earth observation and climate modeling that I think is very relevant for you. It's also the connection with the climate services. So in in ESA, you do more the research, and then you make it the essential climate variables operational in the Copernicus program. And then you have also cross ECVs with carbon, energy, and water cycle research, climate extremes, and you have also tipping point studies that will come here. So a lot of interesting stuff for you. There was this big ESA day yesterday where it was presentation about this program, and yeah, you can get more information about that. And I have also my colleague Anja here in the room. You can say hello. 
and, and uh, in order to, if you have questions afterwards. Okay, then we have the next. This is, again, a lot of <laughs> these different parameters. This is the plan for the uh, Copernicus climate service with respect to essential climate variables. And you see these colors here. So the red ones are the ones that already are operational in, in the Copernicus climate service. In addition to what is done in ESA, it's more of these meteorological parameters, uh, for instance. They have not been sort of developed. They, 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 there the research has been done in UMETSAT, the meteorological organization. Then you have also in uh, yellow ECVs from reanalysis, and then you see priority list of what you want to have in. For instance, permafrost and snow are priorities. So yeah, I let you take the picture before I go <laughs> over to the next. Then, and then back to this person that said absolutely nothing. So in era five, the usage has then gone from 0.75 in 1979 to 24 million per day in 2019. So you see how the increase of satellite uh, use uh, has been. So in 2020, 50 satellites, in 2010 satellites. Have also a look at the, uh, uh, what has been used. It U US were, were in the lead in the 2000 with the A train and so on, in addition to meteorological satellites. But now, with the Copernicus, Europe is in the lead. We are the best in the world with Earth observation, and we want to stay that way until eternity for, or something. But uh, that's what we are trying to do in the Copernicus program. So, and also, uh, we are beyond absolutely nothing. One, one study, they, there are, is a lot that is done in the Copernicus Climate Service. Uh, and we have no time to go into all. But it was one pro a project called CARRA that I want uh, you to make aware of. And that is the regional reanalysis of the Arctic here, and where you will get much more detailed data for the Arctic. And I think it will be released in <coughs> 2025, 2026, the next phase. It's led by the Met Office, Harald Schieberg uh, at uh, the Met Office. So please contact him uh, for more information about that. But I think that can be very interesting for you. Then we are going to the national services, and, and we are doing a lot of stuff that I think is underexploited today. Uh, we have a glacier service. I don't know, uh, how many glaciers do we have in Norway? Anyone? Do you know? Uh, we have approximately 3,000. So that means that we can have a look at all different parameters here with NV. And normally it's been 80 that has been monitored very regularly. So we are extending a lot. And we, we have also data from yeah, approximately 88 and so forth, but now we can have new data every year. So also for archeology span and stuff, it, it will be very interesting to see when something melts. So we will have exact knowledge. Okay, and then, yeah, another thing, avalanches. We didn't know that it was possible to measure avalanches with radar from uh, uh, radar satellites in 2010. We had ideas, but the satellites were too poor. With Sentinels, we understood that that was possible in 2015. And, now, and that means that we have records every year for how many avalanches that has been going on in Norway. So, we have our record until now is registration of 175,000 avalanches per year. And then you can make it local with temperatures, with per precipitation, and all these kind of things, and get much more local info and important for adaptation. This is also, we are very, very proud of this service. With uh, radar satellites, you are able to measure by the millimeter how mountains move, how houses move, and so on. So in Norway, we have out here on insarnu.no availability of five billion measurements point, me measurement points in Norway with time series about how it moves. And here you can see a place in, uh, in northern Norway, Honningsvåg, where you see this area here. The green is stable, the r uh, red is moving up to two centimeters per year. So that means and here you see the size of it. And when you have such a, a mountain going out, out in the fjord, you get a tsunami. So you have, maybe some of you have seen the movie Bölgen, and, and this is a new 
mountain that we have found. So when we released it, we found 100 new sites. So landslides we are able to look very detailed into, and also are they moving due to permafrost melting or due to water, more precipitation and so on. And here you can see the city, so, so you will, uh, you will uh, yeah, if this falls, then it goes into here. Okay, and we can use this for other stuff as well. So sea level change, for instance, when we are modeling how storm surges will come into the cities in the future, Okay, we model it dependent on how the sea level rise, and we have satellites also measuring sea level. But if we have subsidence, like we have in, Tr in Trondheim, with two, three centimeters subsidence every year, then our models are wrong for how far the flooding will come into the city. So therefore, it's extremely important to sort of, of also have this. And we are, by the way, also key persons in developing this for Europe, so we have the same uh, possibilities for every Europe, uh, for all Europe, and we can do it worldwide also. So that was sea level. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I won't go into the... And then permafrost. We are developing now INSAR Svalbard. And uh, we are now trying to understand, because you have, when you have permafrost, you have, you have melting uh, or thawing, and then you, it freezes again. And if you see this time series here, that is quite unique. Uh, you see here is 2017, 18, 19, and so on. And you see here, the melting is starting. We are able to measure. It goes down, 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 and then it refreezes again. And what we are trying to do now, combining these data with boreholes and, and where we have temperature measurements and so on, this is how, how are we going to present this for the public in the, in the future. And, and we are interested in how deep is the melting. Here you can see it melts approximately six and a half centimeter in that season there. Uh, and, and then goes, does it go all the way up again? And how are these connected every year and so on? So for the permafrost in the world, we will be able to look very detailed into this. And then we can combine it with methane measurements and modeling and all these kind of stuff. So, so that's uh, very, very interesting. Okay, so the, we are now having roadmaps for six new types of sentinels. Uh, Glenn will talk about, or the team here will talk about CO2, which is this one. Uh, yesterday we had NASA and ESA at the Space Agency, and we were talking about this with the, uni uh, with the community in Norway, and we will also have polar satellites that are extremely interesting. We have Met Office and Space Agency has pushed to get this into the uh, Sentinel program. We have thermal infrared, we are hyperspectral, that also will be important for methane and CO2. <coughs> but we need more students, we need more knowledge, we need people getting, uh, getting to learn this now in the future. And finally, uh, carbon dioxide. From 2026, we will have two times two kilometer data from this, uh, this satellite. What will that mean? That will mean, according to theory at least, that we will have 100,000 measurements in Norway of CO2 approximately every fifth or every tenth day, because when we have clouds, we need to adjust for that. We do not have it in winter. We will have issues with mountains and, and, and uh, coastline. So that means that maybe this 100,000 positive optimistic view that I have will be a little bit less, but it will be a revolution combined to what we have. So CO2 will become meteorology. So I hope that we won't say that um, absolutely nothing with respect to CO2, because now we are, CO2 is becoming meteorology. And, and um, what we, of course, are very interested in is this is the precision of the measurements. How many point sources are we able to uh, take in Norway, it will probably be more important internationally. It's written into the Paris Agreement that from 26, then global stock take also shall be based on satellites. We are coming into a new age and we are looking forward to it. Just the last slide, uh, some um, uh, advertising for our big uh, glo uh, global space conference that will take place in Norway and Oslo some weeks from now, 23rd to 25th of May, with the International Aeronautical Federation and uh, Norwegian Space Center hosting it. The web page is here. Uh, I hope you can join us. It's already 500, a lot of prominent persons there. Probably used a little bit too long time, but uh, 
I hope you enjoyed. So we want to be the best nation in the world preparing for the new age of CO2. Okay. So a little bit more detail this time uh, and a bit of background to the presentations which will, will follow. So I'm going to talk about this CO2 MVS system, as it's called, uh, a system for monitoring and verification support, um, for mainly for greenhouse gases, CO2 and, and methane. So just as a reminder, I showed this figure before where we have these bottom-up estimates of emissions where we take, generally speaking, activity data times emission factor, and essentially what you sort of heard from Doug Unders, where we will, let's say, look at observations or look from space and convert that information into emissions. So what are we doing um, on this side already? Uh, not necessarily from space, but um, using other observations, ground-based observations. And if we look around, there's quite a few countries that are doing some stuff in this space already. I'll go through a few of the different greenhouse gases and talk about what countries are doing and, and some of the challenges. If you look at the fluorinated gases, things like HFCs and, and so on, these are quite a good candidate for observation-based approaches because they have no natural sources, so you can have a very few observations and get quite good estimates of emissions. Some countries already do this in their emission inventories um, with a sparse observation network. There's also a few good examples uh, where observations have used have been used to detect um, underreporting, let's say. So China has had some identification of underreporting of HFCs. I think also in Italy, a Swiss station, they could pinpoint almost exactly the factory that this uh, underreporting was come fr coming from, and, and so on. So there's a lot that can be done with these fluorinated gases already with ground-based observations. When we get to methane and, and nitro nitrous oxide. One sort of advantage for observation-based approaches is the emission inventories of these um, components are very uncertain. And so if you have a decent observational network, ground-based observational network, then you can do quite a lot with um, uh, these observations to estimate emissions. Already we have the Switzerland and the UK uh, using this in their emission reports. This is more as a, a complementary method to compare against what they estimate in, in bottom-up. Australia looks at various regional sites uh, where there's a lot of oil and gas facilities, and I think some other countries do similar things. When we get to land use change, the forest, CO2, it's a lot more complex. There's a lot of uncertainty in the inventory, so there's a lot of potential for observation-based approaches, but there's also a lot of highly complex processes going on, natural fluxes, human fluxes, we're breathing in and out, CO2, and, and so on. So it's a lot more complex, um, but also, a lot to gain by using uh, a more dense network of observations. With fossil fuel emissions, the FFI, uh, uncertainty in the emission inventories are generally quite low. We can quite accurately measure the, or estimate the amount of oil, for example, that we've used. We know how much carbon is in the oil, so we can, using mass balance, have a pretty good idea of the fossil emissions. So the inventory is hard to beat, um, but observation ap approaches can help, particularly where there's higher uncertainty. Um, there's many examples of um, countries or individuals, researchers, looking at point sources and, and local studies, city level stuff, I won't go into those, but there's also plenty of scope for case studies in, in Norway to look at what um, observation approaches, what satellites can offer and help Norway with in, in decreasing uncertainties in different parts of the emission inventory. Here's an example that comes from the Swiss um, National Inventory Report just to show what this may look like. I'll just focus on this side over here, which is the methane emissions. So there's a few different lines in that figure. There's the prior, what's called the prior, the initial estimate of emissions, which is that sort of bluish color. And you can see there's a very big uncertainty band. There's um, uh, the posterior estimate, which is you use the observations, you go through a model and then they estimate this orange band, and then there's what's reported in the inventory, which is the, which is the green part in the background there. And you can see for, for methane, they're relatively similar. Um, so that's good. Uh, there's maybe a little bit different trend, but there's a lot of uncertainty, so you would have to go into a little bit more detail to figure out how good these estimates are. Uh, there's a lot of variability in the orange line, 
um, uh, because of things like climate changes in every year, you know, different uh, weather, different precipitation and, and so on, and so these estimates can vary from year to year, which you don't see in the inventories. So that sort of gives you an idea of where things are at at the moment, and hopefully with satellites we'll get a, a step change in what we can do on that side. This is an estimate of, uh, or a figure showing different estimates of the land use flux in, in Norway. And I show this one to show there's a great big mess there. <laughs> what can you get from that figure other than there's a lot of variation? There's a lot of different estimates, but this sort of gives a, a, a different sort of perspective on how uncertain things are and how difficult it is in the land sector. Although hopefully, you know, when you dig into the details, to start to pull apart what the different estimates are doing, deal with system boundary issues and so on. You can bring these estimates closer together and see that they're maybe not as different as you think. But then with additional observations, hopefully we can really make a step change there. The, the land use sector will be one of the most uncertain, if not the most uncertain part of the Norwegian emission inventory. So it's, it's very good to have additional information there. As you saw with Doug Undersh's um, presentation, there will be uh, at least two satellites coming, um, measuring, estimating CO2 from the European perspective, but these will be global. It um, you know, rotates around the Earth, taking a, a band as it goes around. Um, it's optical, so you have to have no clouds and, and so on. Uh, but it will give a huge amount of coverage. This is sort of an example of what you might be able to see from um, this sort of satellite. Uh, so you can quite clearly see different point sources. But to estimate emissions from those this figure here is not necessarily easy. So you can see there's a point source, but how much CO2 is coming out of it is a little bit more difficult. These satellites see down through the atmosphere, so they see CO2 from different time periods, from different sources that are all mixed in together. And so you have to use a model to pull that apart and to be able to estimate what the emissions are coming from each of those different point sources and then summing it up to see what comes from, from the country. And you'll hear much more about that in the next presentation. Just to, um, to finish up, um, there's a lot of complexity, a lot of stuff going on, a lot of data. As you saw with uh, Doug Anders' presentation, there's data everywhere. How do we deal with this data and bring it down to a simple estimate of emissions in Norway over a 12-month period? And this is the idea behind what's called this CO2 monitoring and verification support system. Just quickly, I'll touch on various things. Observations are very important, not just the satellites up the top there, but also surface observations. The meteorology is important, and Stephen will talk about this in a minute. Um, uh, it's necessary to sort of integrate, let's say, the observations with the initial estimates of what we think the emissions are to estimate what uh, the observations tell us the emissions may be. This requires a model. It's called integration here, but this is a model that brings the components together and Rhonda will talk about that in a, in a minute. Uh, and then there's this sort of decision support system at the top right there, which is, um, let's say, the tools and the data access and whatever that the user might see at the end. So, for example, an emissions agency can, uh, can come along, an environment agency can come along and see how do their emissions compare to these observation estimates based on this sort of system in place here. You'll see this figure again, I think, today in a, a later presentation. So this is a, a bit of a background, and I'll finish up there and hand over to the next. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. <laughs> yeah, thanks very much for the introduction. Yes, so um, I'll be talking about how we're using satellite observations and, and the iClima project. So the, the main objective of the project is to develop uh, observation-based methods for estimating the fluxes, so that fluxes is just short for emissions and removals of greenhouse gases, and uh, to the point where they can be used to estimate uh, emissions at national and subnational scales and ultimately support inventories and policy decisions. And to do that, we will use uh, both um, so ground-based observations and satellite remote sensing, we also combine this with uh, prior information that we get from data-driven models and process-based models. And we put this into a so-called atmospheric inversion. Atmospheric inversion is a, a way, it's a statistical way of optimizing the, the fluxes to best match the observations, given some constraints from uh, prior information that we have. 
And then these uh, estimates from the inversion uh, will be uh, made comparable to what is required for the inventory. And, and then we try to reconcile any differences that we might have. So how are we using uh, satellite observations of CO2? Well, in iClima, we made a, a decision not to try and estimate the fossil fuel emissions of CO2. And as uh, Glenn already mentioned, this is because the fossil fuel inventories are actually quite accurate. So it's a mass balance um, approach for the fossil fuel. You know how much fuel you've burnt, how much carbon is in that, and then you can relatively easily calculate the, what CO2 was emitted. There are also other projects that are focusing on fossil fuel CO2 emissions, so we decided not to tackle this, but rather to look at uh, the land use, land use change in forestry. That's LULU, CEF, uh, fluxes of CO2. So that can be both um, a source of CO2, but also a sink of CO2, depending on whether, for example, you have regrowth of forest that could take up CO2, or whether you uh, have deforestation or biomass burning, which can, of course, uh, release the CO2 to the atmosphere. So uh, satellites uh, see the total column of uh, the atmosphere. Uh, total column, uh, in, uh, in our <laughs> like scientific community, we use uh, X to sh indicate the total column uh, mixing ratio. So it's X CO2 means just total column CO2. And so, the, of course, the total column CO2 is sensitive to all the processes that affect uh, CO2. So fluxes on the, the land from photosynthesis, respiration, from any kind of burning of uh, biomass, also to emissions from burning of fossil fuels, but also the ocean uh, has fluxes of uh, CO2 as well. So there's lots and lots of processes going on that all affect CO2 in the atmosphere. So what we uh, try to do is uh, we use an atmospheric transport model which re relates all these fluxes to changes in uh, total column CO2. And then we s uh, subtract the influence of the fossil fuel emissions and, and cement and um, ocean fluxes using the best available estimates that we have. And uh, the, since the fossil fuel emissions are quite be uh, better known than the land use, land use change fluxes, um, we can do that. So, and, and then we use an atmospheric inversion to tr find the optimal um, uh, fluxes from the land biosphere that best explain the remaining changes in XCO2. Um, so this, this diagram is just showing all the different processes that are affecting the, the atmospheric CO2. So then we have uh, land biosphere fluxes of CO2. So how do we relate these to what's um, reported in the inventory? So th what the inventory reports is changes in carbon stocks. So they go out and, and measure trees and uh, they try to uh, they have cam uh, canes where they have uh, lots, where they have in forests, for example, they try to establish uh, how the tr uh, forests have, have grown or been uh, harvested or if there's been fires and so on. So they really try to establish from the ground level uh, what the change in the carbon stock is. And this is um, above ground carbon, that's largely trees. So uh, changes in uh, below ground carbon, so there's a lot of uh, carbon in root mass and so on, below ground and soil organic carbon. So if you have a change in uh, above ground carbon, um, the below ground carbon or the soil organic carbon, if, it, if you have a, a reduction in any of those, that will be associated with the emission of CO2 to the atmosphere. If you have an increase in the uh, carbon stock, that is associated with the removal of CO2 from the atmosphere. So um, we can relate uh, our estimates based on the satellite observations uh, to the inventory. And what the inventory reports is only changes on um, managed land. So we have to then uh, mask out uh, the managed land and our estimates to compare with the inventory. Uh, so that's shown there. Uh, yeah, so we can do that. Uh, so now I'll talk about methane. So we're also using satellite observations of methane. Um, we have two activities, uh, um, so largely separate into two activities. One of them is um, trying to detect plumes of methane above the background mixing ratios. Um, this, as uh, Glenn showed for for CO2, this kind of plume structures that you get from CO2 emissions, you get the same kind of uh, plumes from uh, emissions of methane as well. And using uh, so machine learning methods like for neural networks, you can uh, detect uh, these, these plumes. And once we've detected the plumes, of course, we need to relate that to what is being emitted. And so normally uh, we use a, so a plume model to relate the mixing ratios uh, to, to the source emission. 
but uh, this can be very uh, computationally intensive. So what we're trying to do is uh, to also use uh, train a neural network to actually estimate the emissions as well. This, of course, has to be then verified uh, with the so physics-based approach. But um, this would, if we could do that effectively, that would uh, allow us it would be much more computationally efficient. And um, this is actually an example from a previous study using the satellite uh, Sentinel 5P, uh, the instrument Tropomi and detecting uh, large methane sources globally. And so each of these large methane sources are indicated by an orange spot, and the size of that spot is the size of the emission. And you can see over Europe, there were not very many orange spots. Uh, it's just because the sources in Europe are, are generally not large enough to be seen by Tropomi. And so we are actually, in, in iClima, we're looking at other sa uh, satellites which uh, have a smaller or finer resolution and a better detection limit uh, to detect uh, smaller sources which are not yet uh, de uh, detectable with the satellite like Tropomi. The other activity we have is to use atmospheric inverse modeling to estimate the fluxes of methane on a, on a grid. Uh, and so we're going to use all the all the observations, um, we relate these, uh, the, well, the prior estimate of the fluxes to changes in X methane, and then the atmospheric inversion to infer what the optimal uh, fluxes of methane are on, on a regular grid. And using the spatial and temporal variability of these uh, fluxes and some prior information that we know about how the fluxes should behave, we can try to uh, work out also some of the, the source types. Um, this is just an image of uh, Tropomi. Uh, so annual mean uh, methane mixing ratios um, for the whole, whole globe. And uh, already uh, Doug mentioned this uh, before, but just to compare uh, what we currently have, for example, from OCO2, which we're using in iClima at present, and then Sentinel-5P Tropomi, and what uh, CO2M can offer. And uh, so CO2M, it can measure uh, CO2 and NO2, as well as methane with one uh, instrument. It will have a bit better precision uh, for CO2 and for, for methane. It will have quite a wide swath, so that's how what the, the satellite can see, um, and quite a, a good resolution of 4 by 4 kilometers. And uh, what is also, it will have an 11-day repeat cycle. So uh, 11 days, after 11 days, it will come back and review the same uh, area. So. Uh, so that is also a little bit better than what we have in existing satellites. Yeah, so thanks very much for your attention. Uh, so the roadmap for CO2M and CO2MBS is a work that was commissioned by the Norwegian Space Agency. Uh, and it has been performed by a team from NILU and uh, CICERO together. It was led by uh, Arvi Schilling from NILU. So just... Oh, okay, that's... Okay, a lot of slide, but okay. <laughs> um, I just wanted to start by uh, recalling what the CO2M and the CO2MVS is for those of you who do not yet have all these terms under the skin. So, um, the CO2M is this uh, satellite mission which is planned to be launched probably early 2026 that we've heard about already. Um, while the CO2 MVS is this monitoring and verification support capacity that uh, Glenn described and which is where the data from CO2M as well as other observational data and bottom-up data are all processed uh, and supposed to feed out um, uh, information of the type that inventory agencies and others um, can use. So the purpose of this roadmap process has been to look into how Norway can prepare for these two newcomers uh, to see how we can get the most out of the CO2M uh, data. So in this process, we've been looking at uh, what kind of uh, data will we expect to get from CO2M. Uh, we've been looking at uh, how that can be used and who are the users. Um, We've been um, uh, looking at what kind of developments that are needed within all these different boxes in the CO2 MVS structure, if you're able to recall the, the figure that, uh, that Glenn uh, showed. Uh, and to some degree, we've also been touching upon how Norwegian research uh, environments and government agencies could 
uh, contribute to developing uh, the CO2 M, uh, MBS. Uh, and when I said that we've been uh, looking at all these questions, I don't mean that we have the full answers to them, rather we've been scratching the surface and pointing to um, uh, questions that uh, would be useful to, uh, to look, more, uh, look into in more details in further studies. Uh, so the CO2M, I, I think Doug Anders was able to convince everybody that uh, the, the, the CO2M will give a lot of new information about uh, CO2 and methane pr primarily. Um, he also mentioned briefly that there, there are certain limitations and some of them um, very relevant to Norway. The graph here shows uh, the height of the sun throughout the year at different latitudes, the blue line being roughly Oslo. Uh, and days that are below this uh, dotted line here are days with um, probably two where the sun is not high enough to give good observations. So you see there's a period in winter where uh, there won't be good observations. And in addition, uh, clouds uh, will limit uh, the number of useful observation. Mountains that are blocking the view to valleys uh, will also limit the coverage. So uh, the CO2M will not be kind of a standalone thing, thing but uh, something that will be used together with other observations uh, and bottom-up data as well to give a complete picture. So what are the potential uses um, of CO2M um, in Norway? Uh, well, one of the main uh, objectives of uh, CO2M and CO2MBS is to help uh, uh, ver with verification of national greenhouse gas inventories. Um, and Glenn mentioned briefly that some countries have already started doing this uh, based on observational data. And uh, we think there could be a potential to do this also in uh, Norway. Um, the Norwegian government, uh, as well as maybe environmental organizations uh, and other, could also be interested in using CO2M, uh, CO2MBS data to, to get information about emissions internationally. That could be under the global stock take, uh, under the Paris Agreement. It could be uh, of interest to, to follow uh, emissions in a certain country where you would like to have an additional source of information in addition to, to the inventories could also potentially be uh, uh, to gain information about deforestation, which is a topic that the Norwegian government is very strongly involved in through the Red Plus initiative. Um, it could be used for, to gain information about large point sources. It could potentially be used to uh, improve the estimates at uh, uh, the municipal level. I put a question mark behind it because I think uh, it may be more uncertain than the other things here, whether the precision level will be sufficient. Uh, and last but not least, uh, it will be valuable uh, in research and could help, uh, for example, understanding better the CO2 and the methane cycles. Um, so this is a roadmap, so what is the way forward that we point out? Uh, firstly, we see that there is a need for continuous cooperation between uh, research environment, government agencies, and then we include both the, the agencies that are involved in uh, greenhouse gas inventories as well as the Norwegian Space Agency, uh, and possibly also uh, certain industries. Then we point out uh, a number of studies that would be useful to do some of which could be done in the pre-operational phase, uh, and that includes things uh, like improving the input data, uh, improving the models, um, and running tests based on the synthetic data. And then once the operational phase starts in 2026, uh, there will also be a need uh, for studies and running tests with the actual CO2M data. So, that was it. Um, this roadmap will be published in June and it will uh, become available on the websites of the Norwegian Space Agencies uh, and uh, on NILU, I think. So, thanks. Uh, good morning, everyone. Yeah, we've heard a lot today about the satellites and uh, I'm going to talk about 
four of the reasons why we still need ground-based data. So what you have up here is an image of our uh, atmospheric observation station in the high Arctic at Zeppelin. Uh, and yeah, this is located on Svalbard, as the map indicates. And what I've put in this table is just a comparison of the precision of the ground-based network compared to the latest satellites. And the examples I've used are the Tropomi satellite on the Sentinel-5P and the upcoming CO2M. And what you see is the Zeppelin Observatory has a precision for CO2 uh, much, much better or, uh, than, than from the upcoming CO2M. And the same story again for methane compared to both Tropomi and CO2M. And so in this case, better means not only is it, it's one order of magnitude or, or higher better, but it is also, and this is a more subtle point, a better quantified error. And this is because of the measurement technique. So for ground-based stations, you have the capability to calibrate regularly your data. And this better quantification of the error um, is, means that these data are, are, are essential or better used for models and for also for the verica verification of satellites. Um, and it's important to note that many of the emissions, particularly biogenic emissions, are occurring over large areas. And the changes in these emissions, and it's the changes that are often important for climate change, right? The changes in these emissions are below the threshold at which the satellites can directly detect. It's important to note, though, that the satellites are, of course, uh, much, much better than the ground stations at identifying large point sources occurring in remote areas. So, for example, over, over areas over Asia or Africa where there are no ground stations. Um, yeah, um, the next reason is the temporal and spatial resolution. Um, so what you have on the left is an image where the, the color, the heat map, basically shows where the ground-based observations at Zeppelin have been sensitive to what's happening at the surface. On the left panel particularly is the, the so-called Arctic haze period, which is December, January, February, March. And if you look at uh, uh, the image on the right, this is uh, methane from uh, the retrievals from Tropomi for, for methane in January, averaged. And you'll notice that this area where the observations are sensitive is roughly 60, from, from about 60 north, is, is, there's no data available from Tropomi. And this is to do uh, with the, the way the, the satellite measures. And it's, it's uh, the lack of daylight, the cloud coverage, and uh, the surface. Like, for example, the ocean is strongly infrared absorbing and, and it's difficult for uh, the satellites to see in these areas. So, um, yeah, and also the repeat rate, how often the satellite returns will determine how much you can see. So, in summary, you have no continuous data for a single location from satellites. Um, but again, uh, satellites do provide coverage of many, many locations where you're not likely to see uh, with the ground-based observations at the same time. Um, another advantage is the capability for near real-time monitoring uh, of events. So when you have a ground-based network, you have access uh, to the data in near real time, and you can make timely assessments and respond rapidly to changes that are observed. Uh, a recent example of this is the, the North Stream leaks, so where a large amount of methane was released from these uh, broken pipelines in the Baltic Sea. And we were able to look at data in the atmospheric stations uh, shown on the left uh, within hours of the event, and we were able to start using these data put these numbers into models to scale our estimates and, and give an initial first order estimate of how much methane was released. And we were able to communicate this to the public the next day. Um, and this was a case where if you, the satellites at the time did not, were not able to observe the first part of the leak in the first days because of cloud cover. Um, And the last reason, number four, uh, that I want to give today is that actually the, the, the ground-based data is essential for the verification of the measurements with satellites. So satellite data need to be verified with respect to the truth. 
uh, which in this case is the lowest error estimate data, which is the ground network. And this is why for the CO2 monitoring and verification system, uh, it, it is already planned that this will rely on a combination of ground-based or in-situ observations, emission inventories, and satellite data. So to conclude, satellite observations build on an existing foundation of ground-based observations. With that, I want to thank you for your attention and thank the funding. Thank you. OK, um, so I think I'll start by saying that uh, I kind of over-interpreted the message from Cicero. Uh, I got a message that in my head said, um, you can uh, have slides to your presentation, but if you have, just have some pictures. Uh, so I <laughs> ended up, I, I was like, OK, I can do that. <laughs> so I ended up uh, with three pictures that I'm going to show you. Um, but before I show you those three pictures, I will um, recap a little bit about the, the national inventory system that I'm a part of. Um, it's Statistics Norway, uh, NIBU, and the Norwegian Environment Agency. Um, we make these bottom-up estimates of the greenhouse gas emissions, and we call it the, the National Greenhouse Gas um, Inventory. And that's the, the, the cows and the <laughs> things that Glenn talked about on, on this side of his slide. Um, and uh, we report these estimates every year to the Climate Convention, soon to the Paris Agreement, and also to the EU. And we try to be transparent about how we make these figures. So we, every year we publish this very big um, report documenting the methodology, the input data, and also the associated uh, uncertainties. Um, and we also have, um, we are subject to extensive reviews. Um, experts come from um, from the UN and also the EU and go through our, our figures and, and ask us difficult questions and points at what we need to improve. So we have this uh, annual cycle of, of um, continuous improvement of the inventory. And I think that these satellites, uh, the satellites data, should somehow be um, a part of that annual cycle of, imp um, of improvement. Uh, and we see uh, great potential in this, um, in terms of insights on accuracy of our estimates. But, and now you will get to see the first picture <laughs> of this. <laughs> um, okay, so um, this is supposed to illustrate that we need to make sure that the numbers that we compare are comparable. And if I understand this correctly, the, the CO2M um, satellites will provide good quality estimates, at least in the beginning, uh, it will be large emissions of CO2 and methane, and I think also nitrous oxide. Um, and that can be compared with, probably, uh, quite easily compared with the, the um, estimates we have on the large point sources in, in the national inventory. Unfortunately, the, the uncertainty in the large point sources, you know, the factories and the power plants, those things, it's quite low. So we don't expect that the, the data from uh, from the satellites on those sources will change the inventory much. It, it will not improve, the, it will not lower the uncertainty much. Um, what we do, I think, could be very useful, and now you get to see my second picture, is um, because these sat it, it could <coughs> improve the, the timing, you know, the, the, um, uh, that you, we could get kind of quick, a quick overview overview much earlier uh, of, the, of the annual emissions from Norway, 
much earlier than, than our system is able to provide. Um, the, the national inventory um, publishes, like if we think of 2026, when these satellites are probably up, um, the emissions in 2026 will first be published by our system in June uh, 2027. And then uh, we keep working on the details and we, and we um, publish again a much more detailed inventory in November 2027. And then it's all reported to the UN in March 2028. 20, so this is like a slow, slow thing. Um, but maybe the satellites could provide us some kind of overview already in January or maybe, um, <laughs> or maybe several times a year. Something like that. Okay. And then this one. Um, I wanted to uh, say a few words about the F gases and the Lulu sec sector. Um, Glenn mentioned uh, in the beginning that some countries are already um, improving and verifying their inventories on the F gases by the use of satellites. Well, I don't know if it's satellite, me measurements. Um, and we would, I think that's a low hanging fruit for Norway and we would very much like to do that. These are man-made substances. We know about a lot about how much is imported into the country, but we don't know the timing um, of when these F gases are released. Um, so. But the, but the problem is that we're not, we, um, my understanding is that we don't have enough ground-based measurements to, to, uh, to get the annual emission of F gases from Norway. So, but I think that would, that would be a, like a low-hanging fruit, a, a nice place to start with the verification of the, of the um, national inventory data with these monitor monitoring systems. And then um, to the Lulus F sector, the land use sector. Um, there are two things pointing in the... I mean, we, we don't use um, the data from Rona <laughs> yet. Um, but there are two things pointing in the direction of, of satellites being more important also in the, in the invent national inventory. And the first thing is that the new EU regulation on reporting of emissions... Um, uh, Lulus F emissions, the land use and land use change emissions, uh, will require more spatially explicit data in the future. And then the second thing is that uh, Norway, we have to report on environmental accounts uh, to the Eurostat, the, the Statistical Office of, um, of Europe, very soon. And this means that we need to establish a much more detailed um, monitoring system. And when I, when I uh, say these things, it's not just about the sat using the satellites for um, me measuring the, the gases, but also the satellites uh, with images of, of the area, the land use and the land use change. Yes, that's it for me. For me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hello. Uh, I'm Nishal, I'm from uh, Romerike International School, and um, I just had a very basic question for Stephen. Stephen? Um, I just wanted to know how does ground-based observations like work? Like how do you collect data with ground-based observations? Thank you for that question. Um, yeah, so what we have is instrumentation. It's uh, an infrared, in the case of Zeppelin, it's an infrared spectrometer. So we take the air from a mast into the station and we measure via infrared absorption with an instrument called a cavity ring down spectrometer. But, what, but that, that's in, in detail. So it's absorption, it's, it's a spectral, spectral technique. Um, and then this is... Um, regularly calibrated, and the methodology we're using is standardized across a broad network of observations in Europe, uh, for example. There exist 
different networks around the world, but we are involved in the ICOS network, the Integrated Carbon Observing System. So this is a number of stations, can be Norway, France, whatever in Europe, uh, all operating the same method, all inter interoperative and intercomparable. Does that cover it? Um, my name is Minna Wettlesen. I work in the Norwegian Railroad um, Directory. Uh, we are also working on CO2 emissions uh, concerning land use. Um, I'm interested in how do you use the bottom-up information to calibrate the top-down information? Um, so, um, yeah, we use uh, well, bottom-up information. Uh, this is in the terms of uh, um, emissions, so inventory estimates, which are based on so not activity data. So, for example, um, how many cows <laughs> uh, there are and how much uh, methane these cows might be emitting. Uh, for agriculture, for example, so manure management is associated with methane emission. Um, uh, there are uh, fossil fuel, um, so we call them fugitive emissions, so leakage of uh, methane gas from oil and gas operations or facilities. All these uh, kinds of sources um, we can estimate using uh, like knowledge of how many uh, cows, how many well, gas facilities and associated emission factor. But the emission factors can be very uncertain, especially when you come to sources that are related to um, so biology, so uh, microbial processes or biological processes. There the emission factors can be very, very uncertain. And that's where I think especially atmospheric observations uh, can help. Um, so um, we use this kind of information in the so-called atmospheric inversion. And the atmospheric inversion is, is a statistical optimization. So it uses atmospheric observations. We use a, a transport model to relate fluxes at the surface to changes in atmospheric con con concentration. And then we look to compare observed concentration with um, modeled concentration. And of course, there is some uh, difference. And then the statistical optimization it's like a effectively inverse, inverting the transport to relate those dif differences in concentration to differences in fluxes. And then these differences in fluxes are used to correct our uh, so-called prior estimate, which is based on emission inventory, so data-driven model or a um, process-based model. So that's how it works. It's not a, we don't calibrate to the inventory. We, we use this as a, if you want to say in a mathematical way, it's a... It's a it's a way to add a constraint to an unconstrained problem, or so to regularize uh, the, the problem in a mathematical way. Hi, thanks. Um, uh, both Doug and Dish and Glenn mentioned that you need this know-how or new people and new methodology who can apply all these methods. So I'm a researcher from the University of Oslo. We are in the other side of the, this uh, problem. We, ha we, know, we have the know-how how to process or exploit these data sets or applying new techniques, machine learning, data simulation, different models, etc. Are your efforts completely settled? Are you still open for collaboration? What is your future... Uh, direction in that sense. <laughs> We're open for collaboration. <laughs> I think it's um, like there's going to be a huge amount of data, there's a huge amount of opportunity. It's a, really a matter of stimulating the, the resources. I see the research council sitting there. But, um, <laughs> but stimulating the resources so that there's that opportunity there to, to collaborate and find ways to work. It's, um, yeah, we could make a very long list of things to do and things that we could do and there's going to be new ideas. You, know, you let researchers go out and look at various data and they just figure out things that you never ever thought were possible. Maybe the avalanche is an example. Yeah. I, I don't know, people just, oh, maybe we could try this and it works or it doesn't work. And so it's having that capacity and the resource to... Um, to stimulate, so yeah, we think we're all happy to collaborate. Uh, we we are also uh, having a roadmap towards um, 
research on Earth observation that is also now under making. I think it will be finished uh, in June now. Uh, it's Nansen Center and Norse, and I think Meteorological Office also is part of that. So, so, uh, but but what the messages that we already get is that there are too few too few people out there and uh, we need more people into this so there are a lot of possibilities in different uh, direction and I think also this roadmap will be given to the re research council at, at some point um, and also for, for instance we talked about Lulu CF also which is kind of a yeah it's it's uh, we can do a lot more there and we we need to sort of what do we do first and what do we do second and so on so we are open for everybody Glenn aren't we yeah I think we're sort of running out of time, um, so <laughs> uh, we've already go, gone over time uh, a little bit. So thank you all for very good presentations. Thank you all from the audience for very interesting questions, uh, for bearing with us and um, being here today. And I hope uh, that many of you can find other uh, of the uh, activities and events here today maybe also interesting. So have a nice day moving forward and thank you. <laughs>